One tragic fact about the pandemic is that a huge number of the Americans who died didn't have to. For example, in Tennessee, more than 11,000 people would have survived if everyone in the state was vaccinated. In Ohio, the number is closer to 16,000. Nationally, it's nearly 320,000. That's according to a new estimate from the Brown School of Public Health. I speak with Dr. Eric Ding, chief of the COVID task force at the New England Complex Systems Institute. Hey, Eric, how are you? Howdy. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Let's head on inside. We'll have a nice little chat. I met Dr. Ding at our offices in Washington, D.C. He's currently an advisor and COVID-19 expert committee member for the World Health Organization. There's a personal component to that for you because at the age of 17, you go into the doctor, they discover something, and they give you this scary prognosis. So I'd like to start there. Go back in time uh, and kind of tell your own personal story. And how did that shake your world? Yeah, when I was 17, I was a pretty normal high school kid, but I was diagnosed with a baseball-sized tumor in my chest. I, uh, I had difficulty breathing, um, and at first they thought, oh, I just pulled a muscle or something, but the doctors found this huge tumor, and they thought it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is very terminal. And, you know, it got quite a scare. I'm an only child, and my mother was quite upset about it as well. And it wasn't until later that we realized it was a benign tumor, but we only realized it after I survived a large open chest surgery where I lost a quarter of my right lung, uh, one of my thymus glands, as well as outer piece of my heart. And that really kind of shook me, and I realized life is short. I was kind of given a second chance and I really want to do something and try to you know, prevent cancer, prevent disease, prevent epidemics. And at the time, I think they said you've got like five years to live, right? I mean, as a, a kid, 17, it does, it's not a lot of math. You're living to 22. I mean, that's really, really scary, not just for you, but as an only child for your, your parents, I would think. Uh, yeah, you, most 17 year olds don't think about their mortality, right? They're thinking about you know, parties to go to, what they're doing this summer, going off to college. But that really kind of reset everything. And, you know, I hadn't thought about even going to Johns Hopkins before, uh, but that really set me on a different track. And I, you know, want to be a doctor, but then I got to Hopkins and I realized what I want to be more was an actually an epidemiologist, not just a doctor. Dr. Ding is an epidemiologist and health economist. He is co-founder of the World Health Network and the chief health economist for Microclinic International. There's a, a freight train coming and it's headed right towards us. Um, talk to us about those early prognostications, which have proven to be quite true. Um, what was it like? I mean, how was that received? Yeah. I think trying to shout and warn has always been something that I've gravitated towards because, um, you know, early warnings uh, help prevent cancers. Early warnings um, help, could have helped uh, save people's lives from a dangerous medication like Vioxx. Early warnings could have prevented um, Theranos from selling fraudulent products to the world. Uh, and same for preventing Flint, Michigan lead poisonings. But each time we acted too late. And I've seen many pandemics come and go, and we knew that this was gonna be really different. But most academics are very, you know, they're very gun shy in terms of wanting to call something as truly monumentally globally changing pandemic. But I knew that you know, if we sat on our hands and waited and twiddled our thumbs and waited until we were completely proven right, it would be too late. And I remember Dr. Mike Ryan of WHO saying, you know, move fast. And I, I felt that there was a duty to warn. And that's why I kind of shouted at the rooftops that this is going to be a thermonuclear level bad pandemic. 
And today, when you shout from the rooftop, you're not actually on the rooftop. You're in social media, you're on Twitter. So you've got a much bigger audience to listen to you. Yeah, social media is obviously, as you know, in this world, a double-edged sword. It's, it can be a force for good uh, as well as for evil <laughs> in terms of disinformation. And we've, uh, during this pandemic, we've certainly learned about disinformation and misinformation. I think, you know, years ago, I had uh, also done a lot of social media on cancer prevention, w which was my first passion. And years ago, I kind of like honed how to build uh, and maintain public audience um, uh, understanding and translation um, and attention on critical issues of how to protect themselves. And so I, I thought about using my, you know, five million person Facebook pages, but I didn't. I, want, I went on Twitter, which I had almost no following at that time because I think Twitter is the communication source to journalists and to world leaders and to the lay public. And I think with the pandemic early on, that was the best medium because we, it was a duty to warn not just the lay public, but also many world leaders who were very complacent, very asleep at the wheel. As the number of COVID-related hospitalizations and infection rates continue to decline, more governments are dropping the mandate for passengers in public transport to wear masks. Passengers on subways, buses, trains, planes, and taxis are no longer forced to cover up. But the lifting of this requirement may also be creating a false sense of security. Trace it out for me. As you look at the virus, um, it mutates, it changes, it's, the variants obviously. Is it getting stronger? Will it get weaker? I mean, as it continues to kind of mutate, what do you look for in a virus? Well, many people have been saying that, oh, the virus will mutate until it's milder and milder. I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, you know, people said the Omicron was mild. Omicron is not mild, and many countries are having all-time high record deaths. And COVID is moving so fast that it is infecting billions of people. IHME Institute uh, estimated 3 billion people would be infected um, with Omicron in three months. And that's pretty much panning out to be true. And there's no signals that it is weaker, given how deadly it is we are seeing in places that haven't been previously infected. And ultimately, the more exposure, the more warm bodies that we give the virus, the virus will learn how to be more fit. And so as it learns to be more fit, rarely does it become a virus that's simply going to die out. The evolution knows that the way to survive is to, uh, is to penetrate existing immunity, even be more uh, penetrant in terms of breakthrough infections, breakthrough reinfections. And I don't think we should rely on any predictions that the virus will simply fizzle away. The virus goes away only when we have the willpower to put measures in place to put it away. The masks are gone. It's this kind of pronouncement, COVID's left us, we're A-OK. -okay. We all kind of know that's not true, but I think it's, it's this kind of beating down on the policy people till they're finally like, OK, I'm just tired of fighting with you all the time. I think political exhaustion and public health exhaustion is one of the greatest weaknesses during the pandemic. I think people want it to be over and wish it to be over, and the public health funding for pandemic uh, preparedness, for pandemic treatments and testing, obviously are limited. And many people just do not want to deal with it as a political issue because sometimes it is just too fractious. They fear they're gonna lose an election. Um, I think that is the wrong way. I think history will judge us very, very poorly on that. That our society, at the moment when we needed government leadership the most, we were let down by it, that the CDC didn't put out fast enough warnings, stern enough warnings, clear enough warnings, and uh, aggressive enough mitigation and policies to stop this. And I think the changing of the guidelines recently, um, from one day we had 
high transmission across the U.S. The next day, oh, new guidelines. We're going to only care about hospitalizations. We're going to ditch positivity. That immediately half the country turned to green from red the day before with the other guidelines. Um, and I think that's a willfully, willfully uh, dangerous move. Because let's think about it. If we have, um, take for example, uh, motorcycle helmets and bike helmets. Do we only mandate motorcycle and bike helmets when hospital beds are full? No, we have these mandates at all times. Do we only require buckling your seatbelt when hospital beds are not full? No. Do we only ban drunk driving when hospital beds are full? No, we don't. All these things, we have public health measures. That's called public health. It's called prevention. And an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so we do not relax on uh, helmet laws, seatbelt laws, drunk driving laws, simply because, oh, the hospital beds are not full. That's not any way to manage public health. All viruses mutate constantly. When a virus accumulates a substantial number of mutations, it's considered a different lineage. It's labeled a variant. Once it's confirmed, the virus has changed into a more severe disease. That is what we are now seeing with COVID. Eric, we've had Delta, Omicron, who knows what else. What's the next variant look like in your estimation? Well, I think B2 variant is very worrisome. We've seen it uh, time and time again. It outcompetes the original Omicron in countries that both hasn't had a previous Omicron and has had a previous Omicron wave. So that means it's in reinfecting people. There's reinfection potential. It's been acknowledged. And it's basically has vaccine evasion as well. Scary. Yeah, it, it's, it's the reason why China's having surge, Hong Kong, South Korea, all these countries around the world are having surges, as well as Europe. Europe is having another surge again, right after on the tail of their previous surge. So the back-to-back -back surge is because of the new BA2 variant. It's one of those lessons that we need to learn, that the more we allow the virus to spread globally around the world, the more chances it'll have to uh, practice on our bodies and develop a variant that will get lucky and eventually evade or become more infectious. And God, I hope not, but possibly more severe. So masks, everybody's saying get rid of the mask. We don't need a mask mandate. You still wear one, I take it. Yeah, I still wear one wherever I can. And I think right now in the US, we have a lull in cases, which is good. But I think we see the wastewater signals coming that it's going to trend up very soon. It's inevitable in the data that we see it and we see it in Europe. So I think we need mass uh, mandates for crowded indoor places such as restaurants, schools, um, as well as crowded stadiums. But I know people don't want to do it. And if people don't do it, and we have to be realistic, then what do we else do we need? We need either booster requirements, not just two shots, but three shots for 90% protection against hospitalization, as well as we need uh, ventilation and air disinfection standards. If we don't have those requirements, then we're inevitably gonna have another surge. COVID infections can first be detected in wastewater, even before a positive test. In France, Marseille firefighters are gathering samples of wastewater to map variants in the hopes of limiting the spread of the virus. The same procedure is being used in Stockholm. The sewage water testing could help provide important insights into the spread and prevalence of the disease without the need for expensive, widespread individual tests. What about tools and how they've changed? Because I know you, you uh, I, I read one of your tweets recently about wastewater, looking at wastewater as an indicator. Uh, I don't think that was available early on in the pandemic as kind of a, a way of looking at the future, mapping things out. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I remember um, wastewater many years ago, my colleagues and I actually discussed this 
and saying, do we need wastewater testing? And we also discussed, do we need a mobile app that can trace where you were to find other people who you were in proximity with? And um, I helped uh, develop one of the earliest mobile contact tracing apps in 2014, and we were laughed out the room. And my friend who f uh, founded the wastewater virus testing, she proposed it, and she was laughed out the room because when would we ever need such tools, right? But wastewater is incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, the signals that it gives it is completely agnostic of people's willingness to test, completely agnostic of testing availability of, of PCR or rapid antigen, and agnostic of people's willingness to report their home positive tests. It is an objective measure and it's incredibly, incredibly effective of an early warning signal. Whenever you see a spike in wastewater, we invariably, invariably seek increases in cases a week or two weeks later. So again, forewarned is forearmed, and wastewater has somehow turned into this incredibly powerful tool for monitoring, even when people are complacent and don't even go out and test. I was in Iceland, uh months ago, and you actually have to sign up for their tracing app. Uh, and, and when you think about it, you're on a bus, or you're on a train, you're on a plane, somebody's got it, suddenly they can alert you. Um, it's, it's really effective, and yet you don't see it taking off, even though you say the value's there. Why do you think that is? Well, I think in East Asia, where a lot of people are very willing to give some of their information, like in South Korea, Singapore, uh, contact tracing has been wildly successful, wildly successful. And in Europe, uh, contact tracing was also successful, but um, eventually it got too successful because their phone started buzzing too many times um, and people were overwhelmed. And in the US, unfortunately, sometimes some people are very, very hesitant, uh, rightfully so, about privacy and they fear that contact tracing app is a way to track them, which it indirectly is anonymously without actually um, identifying who you are, but simply identifying your proximity to someone who else who had the virus. Uh, you know, I, I respect privacy rights, but at the same time, I think we all should learn that in a pandemic, putting the public health above personal, personal rights is sometimes more important. Eric, thanks so much. Thank you.